Hello and welcome my fellow Rubyists. I wanted to introduce you to Ruby Gems today. My name is Richard Schneeman. So Rails is a Ruby gem. We've been using Rails this whole time. Um, you can run gem install Rails and that will go out uh, to a server and find that code and pull it onto your server. It's pretty neat. Um, Secretly behind behind the scenes, um, we have been uh, using also rubygems.org. Uh, you can actually go there and check out and see um, all the number of times a, a version has been downloaded. You can get some nice links to some stats. You can subscribe to an element. You also see all the different people involved in pushing that out. So here's uh, rubygems.org slash gems slash rails. Uh, and what are Ruby gems, you might ask? Well, Ruby gems are open source libraries. So we talked about using the standard library. If we just do require CSV, then that is, we're telling uh, Ruby to say, okay, well, hey, you've got a, a standard library. We think it's called CSV. We want you to go and load that into memory so we can go ahead and use that now. Well, with, with Ruby gems, you can require Ruby gems, and then anything that you have done gem install onto your system, you can require. Uh, so this is useful for um, open source libraries if someone has solved a very common problem and they say, oh, hey, this is a really common problem or just not even a problem, a feature. They say, I want to build a client that um, interacts with Facebook. You know, I want to build an API client for Facebook. So they can just take all of their code. They can push it onto, uh, um, into, a, into a gem. They can have this nice gem format. And then anyone can download that and anyone can require it and use it. It's, uh, it's very nice in that it lets lots and lots and lots of people share their code, and you can also update very quickly and very easily. Uh, so gems can also use other gems. For instance, if you do gem install device, you might get an output of something like this, where it says fetching warden 1.2.1 and fetching ORM 0.2.4. Uh, .4 and fetching device 2.1.2 and... Uh, you know, then successfully installing all those. Well, you know, hey, we only said install device. What's going on? Well, it turns out that, uh, you know, writing open source libraries is great because we can use open source libraries with other open source libraries. So uh, device, the device gem is, is basically telling your system, hey, yes, I want you to install me, but also I need warden and I also need ORM adapter. So any gem can basically say, hey, we also need all of the, you know, these other sets of gems to be installed as well. Um, it's very nice ecosystem in that if uh, uh, device does not have to reinvent the wheel, it can focus on doing what it wants to do and it can use the functionality it needs from ORM adapter and it can use the functionality it needs from warden uh, and everybody doesn't have to code all of these things uh, from the very beginning. But it does end up uh, causing somewhat of a problem or it used to anyway, uh, where a you install maybe um, device and it is asking for a certain gem and then you install um, wicked uh, which is another gem and that or maybe you install rails and you have all of these different things installed in your system and all of them need different versions of um, of those libraries and in uh, in ruby gems whenever you're doing a require you're just requiring a, a specific um, gem. You would just say, if we go back, we would just say require warden. We don't say require warden 1.2.1. .1. Uh, you say require warden. So if device is expecting 1.2.1 .1 and somebody else is expecting a different version of warden, well, then there's going to be errors in our code. So how can we, how can we avoid this? You know, that sounds like a pretty bad scenario. Back, you know, back in the day, um, it used to happen very, very often. You know, I would run, I would install things uh, to my system and then I I would just say hey you know everybody else you need to install these things and they would install them and they'd be slightly different versions and then we deploy it up to production and those would be slightly different versions and um, you know it was just kind of a mess um, so in order to solve this problem uh, the community responded and uh, ha we have come up with a tool called um, Bundler, which is we've been using quite a bit. Um, you've been doing the, the bundle install and those gem files. So gem files now kind of synonymous in inside of, uh, of Ruby. Everybody has said, man, this is, this is a pretty good idea. We can just say, hey, at an application level, let's list out all of the gems we're going to use. 
and um, so we can list out and we can say we're going to use Rails gem and the um, PG gem, which is uh, Postgres and Rescue and, and Sextant and you know whatever else. Uh, and optionally, you can also define and say this is the exact version I want, or you can say I want about this version or any version over this or any version under this, but it, it gives you that ability, that extra ability of, of telling your system what gems you want. Uh, so once you have that gem file, you can then run bundle install. And what this is going to do, it's going to go out and it's going to find all those gems, and then it's going to find all of their dependencies. So Devise had to install a couple of gems before it could be fully installed. So similar to that, most gems require or depend on other gems. Um, once they, uh, once Bundle has done that, it's going to find all of those version numbers, and then it is going to try to resolve those version numbers for you. That means if one library says, okay, you know, we require library X over version of one, and another one says we require version uh, library X under version of three, well, it knows that anything in between one and three is okay. Um, if everything can be satisfied, if all of the version numbers can be satisfied, then Bundler will install all of those gems for you. So here we go. Um, it'll just go through and in install everything from our gem file. Um, so instead of having to manually go through and say, gem install rails, gem install rescue, gem install pg, um, it is just going to go and, and do all that for us and uh, do it in such a way that it is repeatable and doesn't ha we don't have any conflicts in version numbers. Um, Another really nice thing is that it also creates a gem file dot lock for us. So it is going to take the output that it 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 um, computed and it is going to say, okay, well, hey, action mailer depends on action pack and mail of you know of these versions, and action pack is going to depend on all these things. So it already calculated all of this. So this is kind of like almost like a shortcut that. Um, that bundler is going to be using in the future. So next time we run bundle install, we can just kind of use this cheat sheet and say, all right, well, hey, he, you know, here's our, he, here are these requirements of these different versions of these different gems. Um, you know, can we just use these? Are, are these already installed in the system? And by having the gem file.lock and checking this into source control, it is going to ensure that um, what you are run, running locally is the same thing that you are running in production, which is great. So you don't want your version numbers to be different from development to production. You want everything to be as similar as possible. Uh, so you always want to keep your gem file and your gem file.lock in version control. And again, that is going to be how we are going to keep those, those, uh, those different elements straight. Uh, it's going to con guarantee consistent behavior across multiple multiple machines whenever we're installing those Ruby gems. Um, we also have the ability to run um, bundle exec, and what this is doing is saying, "All right, we are only going to use the gems specified in the gem file of the current project when when running a command." So you could say bundle exec rake db migrate or bundle exec uh, rails console and in that scenario, we're restricting our system and saying only use the things in the gem file. Um, this is really convenient, actually, if you have tons of projects on your system that have installed tons of, of different gems and can help uh, resolve some conflicts. So um, as you move forward, and maybe you've already even seen this in some documentation, that we're going to be using the bundle exec keyword, uh, but now you know what it means and what it does. So the next section is going to be pretty heavily focused on Ruby, and we're going to be talking about dealing with nil. Stay tuned.